Hello. Hey. I'm internet sensation and teen heartthrob, Jared Spool. Uh, putting on an event like this is a tremendous amount of work. The folks at Sigma, Sean and his amazing team, have done a fantastic job. Let's make some noise for these guys. OK. Hello. What are we doing? Come on, computer. Computer. There we go. OK. I want to talk about what it means to have a successful UX project, right? a user experience project. What, what does that actually mean? One way we can measure it is in the amount of investment that an organization makes. And probably the largest investment that has ever been made in a UX project was for something that we hardly ever talk about in our field. And what I'm talking about is the Disney Magic Band. The Disney Magic Band is a bracelet. And this little bracelet project was a billion dollar investment. Comes in about, what, about 800 million quid. That's what they spent on a bracelet. It's not just any bracelet. When you order the bracelet, you actually order it weeks ahead of going to one of the parks, because it only works in three places in the world, Florida, California, and Shanghai. And this bracelet comes in this amazing box with characters all over it. And each bracelet is named for each family member and has been customized and tailored for the purpose of that family member. And inside each bracelet is a slew of technology, including three different radio transmitters, a GPS system, a uh, NFC payment system, and a lo-fi Bluetooth. And you can use that combination of things to do things like magically open the door of your hotel room, or uh, magically be able to get on any ride as a VIP, or magically be able to wave your wrist and just charge things to your credit card, even when you mean to. <laughs> but probably one of the most magical things that I like about it is because of the GPS built into the unit. If your child is celebrating their birthday in the park, which happens quite frequently, their favorite character will actually use the GPS to find them in the park and wish them a happy birthday. It's a little creepy. <laughs> but it's cool. And if Uber has taught us anything, we can have both creepy and cool at the same time. <laughs> now, the thing that is most amazing to me about the Magic Band is that Disney made it. Because I have been watching the Disney UX teams and their progress for decades. And it just stuns me that they pulled this off. Because when I first started working with them, which was way back in 1997, I started working with the UX team over at Disney, uh, Walt Disney Parks and Resorts. This was their best work. <laughs> this was the homepage for Disney.com. And they were extremely proud of this homepage. And they really believed that this was what the web should be. Thankfully, we've all learned. This site was not only not the easiest thing to look at, it was tremendously difficult to use. 
particularly for its primary use case, which was to book a vacation at a Disney park and resort. And it was so difficult to use that for more than a decade, my team used this website as its primary tool to train people how to do usability testing. Because it turns out that in order to train someone to do basic usability testing, it helps to have something that's extremely unusable. And this site delivered in spades. We used to have a bunch of tasks. My favorite task that we would train with was a task that we actually got from uh, a real uh, park aficionado, what Disney refers to as a world file, somebody who just loves going to the park and particularly loved taking their kids to the park. She had a six-year-old who loved trains. And she wanted to be able to stay at an affordable hotel that was on the Walt Disney property that was on the monorail system, so that every day she and her six-year-old could take a train to wherever their destination was by just stepping out of the hotel, getting on the monorail. So we crafted a usability test task. And the usability test task was, what is Walt Disney World's least expensive hotel on the monorail? Now it turns out that there are only three hotels in Walt Disney World on the monorail. The Grand Floridian, the Contemporary Resort, and the Polynesian. It also turns out that two of those hotels are wicked ass expensive. And one is the Polynesian. So the Polynesian is the right answer. That's the least expensive hotel on the monorail. Now what fascinated me about this task was that we did it thousands of times. And we started keeping track of successes and failures and patterns and things we saw. And one of the things that we noticed right away was that only about one out of every 10 participants in our study could complete this task successfully. They could actually get to the Polynesian Resort. The rest of them would end up someplace else or not be able to complete it, just give up. But what's even more fascinating was that two out of every 10 would not only fail at the task, but fail in this glorious way. They would fail by ending up finding a hotel at Disneyland instead of Disney World. Now, for those of you who are not familiar with the difference between Disneyland and Disney World, there are many, many differences. Probably the most important difference is that they are <laughs> 5,000 kilometers apart. And what made this distinction even more interesting is that Part of what the training of a good usability test moderator is, is how to ask follow-up questions. Because what you want to do is not only have we detected that there's been a failure in the test task, but we want to find out why. What is it that we might learn to figure out what we would change? And so we want to understand, does this person just prefer California? Do they uh, uh, just want to stay in that hotel? Are they? Uh, realizing that they are in two separate parks? Do they not know the difference between the parks? Did they think they were in Disney World, but in fact ended up in Disneyland? We want to know the difference. So we would ask questions. One of the questions we would ask, we would train people to ask, was could you take the monorail from that hotel to Epcot Center, which is only in Disney World in Florida? And the participant, after being asked if they could take the monorail from their hotel to Epcot Center, would inevitably always turn back to the machine, click around the website for a bit, turn back to the moderator, and say, yes. <laughs> yes, you can. Now, I just want to point out, for those of you who never experienced it, the monorail is a six-car train. It travels approximately 45 kilometers per hour. And it's a five, 
or 45, yeah, that's right, yeah, 45 kilometers per hour. And it's a 45 or 5,000 kilometer uh, tra distance from one to the other. So that's, that's quite an experience. I was giving a presentation about this once many years ago. And at the end of the presentation, I'm packing up my stuff, and this, this woman comes up to the edge of the stage, and, and she says, uh, uh, hi there. And I look down, and I look at her badge, and it says, Walt Disney World Parks and Resorts. I'm thinking, uh-oh. <laughs> and she says, I want to tell you something. Like, OK. She says, you can't tell anyone. <laughs> OK. She says, that thing with people picking the wrong hotel in the wrong park on the wrong part of the country, that happens all the time. <laughs> I do some research about this, and I come to learn that, in fact, it does happen all the time. In fact, it happens so often that Disney, in their ultimate quest to deliver the best customer service, actually holds back a set of rooms. They do not rent out a set of rooms uh, uh, in case someone shows up in the wrong theme park with reservations for the hotels in the other park on the other side of the country. They are so afraid someone's vacation would be ruined because of that, that they actually are prepared. They are ready. And they do this even when the park is completely sold out, when there isn't a room to be had, when prices are at their highest. Right? This is the point where they could make the most money off of any available room and they are holding inventory back to make sure that no customer is disappointed. Now imagine working for a company that is so dedicated to customer service that they hold back their most precious inventory because it's too fucking hard to change the website. <laughs> and that's where Disney was in 1997. So the fact that they could create the magic band in 2014, this was amazing. And that's the question. How did they get there? How did they get from being in a place where it was too hard to change the website to a place where they have probably the most advanced uh, park experience anyone has ever created? That's what we want to figure out. And to do that, we have to start with how just people learn to do things. We have to understand that. Now, whenever we're learning to do something new, we're learning to cook, we're learning a new language, we're learning to design, uh, uh, we all start at the same place. We all start in a stage called unconscious incompetence. And it's called unconscious incompetence because we just started, and because we just started, we're not good at this. We are incompetent at it. Everybody starts incompetently. That's how skills work. But the other thing is, is because we've never done this before, we don't know how incompetent we are. In fact, as far as we're concerned, this thing didn't exist before. We did some stuff. It now exists. That's pretty cool. We are completely unconscious about how bad it is we just did. We think it's great. <laughs> and we continue to do this. In fact, we will continue to do this and be really proud of what we do for quite a while in many instances, usually until a close friend takes us aside and says, please stop. <laughs> Don't cook that anymore. It's not good. <laughs> or here's a recipe or something. And it's at that moment that we learn the difference between good and bad. We learn the difference between good cooking and bad cooking, good uh, uh, language speaking, bad language speaking, good instrument playing, bad instrument playing, good design, bad design. And at that moment, we graduate to the next stage. The next stage is what we call conscious incompetence. 
We are still incompetent. We still have no idea how to do this stuff. But now we know we're incompetent. This is a very sad point in the process. <laughs> People get very disappointed. Before this, it was very blissful. We're just making stuff along, and then suddenly, boom, now we're incompetent. Many of us were expert artists until the age of six or so. Every piece of work we did went into the gallery, which we called the refrigerator, and uh, it was all displayed for all to see. And then at some point, things stopped showing up there. <laughs> and that's when we get the message. And many people at that stage give up. I can't draw. I can't cook. I can't speak French. We just give up. But a few persist. A few continue. And that persistence involves learning the rudiments, learning the process, being able to do the basics, following a recipe, being able to play an instrument based on sheet music, learning the grammar and learning the sentences and practicing. And all of those things eventually push us into what we call conscious competence. Conscious competence is when we can do a decent job, but we have to think about everything we do. We have to think about every step of the recipe. If we go off a step, everything's ruined. We don't know what to do. So we just have to do it and think about it step by step by step by step. And then this amazing thing happens. One day, we walk into a situation, and suddenly, we're not looking at the recipe. We're not following the sheet music. We're just doing it based on what we've learned, our experience. And that point is when we transition to unconscious competence. Unconscious competence is when we are able to solve the problem, do the thing, without just uh, uh, thinking about it, just taking our experience and putting it together, our knowledge, and making it happen. We can think of this scale in terms of a series of journeys. The first journey is getting from unconscious incompetence to conscious incompetence. And that we can think of as literacy. Literacy is basically understanding the difference between good and bad, understanding what the mechanics are, understanding what the pieces are, understanding what contributes to good versus bad. We can think about the journey from conscious incompetence to conscious competence as fluency. At this point, we're beginning to form sentences, and we're beginning to understand the sentences that are spoken to us. And we can uh, uh, think about different types of recipes and what the process are, and learn things like mise en place and different techniques. And from conscious competence to unconscious competence, that journey we could call mastery. When we talk about mastering our craft, what we're really talking about is this segment of our journey, getting so good that we can walk into any situation and we will know how to handle that situation, even if it's one we've never seen before. And this is the journey that the design team at Disney took. Every member of that team took this journey. And they got good. But Disney as a whole is an organization. And if we want to think about the journey that the organization takes, we have to look at it slightly differently. It's a different scale for them. It starts with what we call the UX Dark Ages. The UX Dark Ages is when the organization is not paying attention to users at all. They are paying attention to their business. They're paying attention to making things work on the technology. That team in 1997 was just thinking about, how do I get things to display in HTML? That's all they cared about. They added a little bit of Tinkerbell to it, because they added a little bit of Tinkerbell to everything. But that's all they were thinking about. However, 
At some point, someone shows up in, in the organization who understands that users exist and that we should design something for them. They're usually not highly placed in the organization. They're usually just someone amongst the common folk. But they push, and they're able to get the organization to start thinking about designing something that's actually pretty good. And that we call spot UX design. Spot UX design is when you have a, a low-level person who is pushing hard enough that they actually ship something that has a decent design. But shipping one thing is different than shipping everything. And as a result, they usually get drowned in the organization, and they get lost, and sometimes they leave in a fury. But every so often, uh, an executive, someone with some amount of role power, says, you know what? This UX thing, this is actually important to us. We need to start investing in this. And at the point that that investment starts to happen, that's when we get to UX design as a service. And this design as a service is when a team gets built. The, the, the executive says, let's build a team. First designers get hired, then managers get hired, then people are told you need to hire the team internally. It becomes this internal agency that serves the rest of the organization. And that service team is there to help everybody build better designs. But they do it in this sort of internal agency model. And we used to think that this was the best we could do. That if we could get that manager a seat at the table, there's a table somewhere. I don't know if you know this. <laughs> it apparently has like Herman Miller chairs. And it is, uh, uh, it is the place that our manager wants to sit. We can get that seat at the table. Amazing things happen. Our desks turn into rose bushes, and uh, it's just magical. Uh, uh, so they, if we could do that, if we could get that, we, that was success. That was all we were trying to do. We would be, we will have arrived. And then we found out that there's more. That, in fact, that isn't it. That, in fact, if you just get a seat at the table, it means you go to more meetings. <laughs> um, and that really what the next inflection point is, is when one of the teams that the service team is working with suddenly demands their own designer. They no longer want to work with the team. Not because the team isn't good, but because they can't get enough of them. Every so often, the person who works on their team has to go work on some other team's stuff too. That's not acceptable anymore. Design is too important for our work. We need a full-time designer. So they start arguing for this. And they finally hire their own designer to work on their team. And at that point, we get to embedded UX design. And in embedded UX design, we are now uh, putting people full-time onto teams. They report to that team's management. They are working for that team. They're thinking about multiple releases at once. And for a long time, we thought this was the end game. If we could get a designer on every team, we were golden. That's what we were striving for. But then we realized there was another inflection point. And the other inflection point happened when suddenly other team members, not the designer, start making decent design decisions. The developer goes off, codes something up without talking to anybody, and it's actually pretty good. <laughs> How'd that happen? Right? The product manager making decisions about whether they should ship this thing or ship that thing suddenly say, well, we should ship the thing with the best design. I'm like, whoa, my hearing's not working. <laughs> Did you just say best design, not fastest to ship? or?" will get us our de delivery dates? No, no, best design. This has to be good for the users. Like, OK. And suddenly we realized that we've reached another stage. We call that infused UX design. Infused UX design is that moment when the non-designers on our team are actually producing decent designs. They are making smart design decisions. 
This is the maturity of an organization. And when I first started paying attention to the Disney stuff, they were definitely in the dark ages. But when they shipped the Magic Band in 2014, they were definitely infused UX design. That team, every member of that team, whether they were wiring the parks or they were handling what the retail systems were, they were making smart design choices. Every single member. They knew what they were doing. And this process, that maturity, took 17 years. So if you're looking at this and you're putting yourself somewhere on that chart, if you've spent less than 17 years at this, you're ahead of the game. <laughs> Congratulations. You're doing better than Disney did. Now, Disney, as I mentioned, is an organization. And the thing is, is that you can't really measure the maturity of an organization. Turns out, organizations, you may not know this, are made of teams. And teams really can be all over that spectrum, right? A team might be at one place, they might be at lots of places, right? So, so we sort of look at all the different teams in the organization. Now we, so it doesn't make sense to talk about the maturity of the organization. It makes more sense to talk about the maturity of the team. But here's the thing, in order to talk about the maturity of the team, we have to deal with the fact that teams themselves are made of people. At some point, everything turns to Soylent Green. <laughs> and being that they're made of people, it's not just any people. Teams are made up of people who influence the user's experience. They may think of themselves as designers, they may not think of themselves as designers, but they are definitely making design decisions and they are influencing the design. They could be uh, a developer who's just coding something up because they don't know what to do. They could be a product manager. They could be uh, uh, a compliance or regulatory person who's telling us what text we have to put on the screen for disclosures and uh, uh, terms and conditions. They might be an executive who does what we call the seagull maneuver, which is that act where they swoop in, poop all over your ideas, and swoop away. <laughs> the executive poop and swoop. <laughs> and the thing about the, all these people is they can be anywhere on this chart, right? We, our most mature person might be in UX design as service, but we could have an executive who's at the dark ages. They have no clue that users exist. And this is a problem, because it turns out that the way we assess where a team is in the maturity scale is not based on the best person. Giving them a better designer does not actually change the team's maturity. It's not based on the average of all the people on the team, because they don't cancel each other out. It is based, in fact, on the least mature person on the team. The least mature person is, uh, uh, is the person who is going to give us the biggest trouble. Because if they're an influencer and they don't understand UX, What's going to happen when they're faced with a decision of, for instance, shipping something fast that has a poor UX versus shipping something slow that has a better UX? Guess which one they're going to make. I mean, in their mind, we can't blame them because they can't tell the difference. From their perspective, they're looking at two things that are the same, except this one will ship fast, this one will ship slow. And why would they choose the one to slip sh ship slow? Slip show, show, ship, ship, show, show, slow, ship, ship, show. <coughs> So that's the problem, right? We have to know who our most immature influencer is because it becomes our job to actually get them to be more mature. In fact, I would argue that this is the most important job a design leader can have 
is to take our least mature folks and help them become more mature. That's our job, not putting pixels onto screens. Our job is to help the team become more mature. Back in uh, 1953, Honeywell Corporation came out with a product that skyrocketed. And it was probably the first product to ever capture the imagination of what design could do in what we would call consumer markets. And that was the H model thermostat. The H model thermostat was a simple to use, people dare I say intuitive, device. It was created by a designer. Honeywell had hired Henry Dreyfus. And Henry Dreyfus came in and he did designerly things. He came and he, he researched the people who were going to have this thing. He created lots of prototypes, hundreds of prototypes. He and his team built out these things. They tested them with users. All the things we talk about today, Henry did in 1953. It's pretty amazing, actually. And they shipped it. And it took over the market. It changed how we thought about design for decades. And it was the market leader for thermostats until 2011, when the Nest came out. Now, I don't know if you know this, and this probably won't matter in a little while, but it's an EU regulation that if you talk about design, you have to mention the nest. <laughs> Consider me being compliant with that rule. Maybe that's the one good thing that happens with Brexit. Here's the thing, I'm not going to really talk about the Nest. I don't really care about the Nest. It's as far as I'm concerned, it's just this intrusive device in your house. It's sort of like the Eye of Sauron. <laughs> <laughs> what I want to talk about is how come Honeywell didn't invest the Nest? Why didn't Honeywell come up with this? Honeywell was the leader in the marketplace. How did they miss this opportunity? That, to me, is way more important. That, to me, is the lesson we need to learn from the nest. Because that is the secret to how we get our organizations to ship better products and services. Now, to do that, we need one more understanding of how things mature. And that's how markets grow. Turns out that every time we create some brand new thing, we enter a stage called technology. And that technology stage is really just about making the thing work. This is the Motorola uh, StarTac uh, phone. This thing cost 4,000 pounds. It weighed uh, a th uh, four kilos. It, uh, 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 it was this incredibly expensive device and uh, heavy, and it, it didn't work very well. You had to shout in it to make it work, uh, which, of course, let everybody around you know that you had one. So it, that was good. Um, and this thing, people would just, they bought them because they had to have them. And they were the only ones on the market. So they would pay the expensive money, and they would carry around the heavy weight. Uh, but then competitors come out. And as soon as competitors come out, we get into the second stage, which is the feature stage. And in the feature stage, we are focused on features, feature, 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 feature. We're always thinking about features. And in the cell phone market, features just got crazy for a while. And I feel really bad for the Nokia N95 team because they shipped a fantastic product with the most features any phone had ever seen three months before the iPhone. It could do all sorts of crazy things, but no one ever bought one because iPhone. And that's what happens. Suddenly, there's another point where it's like, we don't care about all these features. We just want something that works. Please give us something we can use. And at that point, the market shifts. 
and it becomes experience. And that's where the iPhone came out. Remember, the iPhone had very few features that most of the leading phones on, at the time had. You could not do video. You could not send pictures in a text. It did not have undo. It did not have apps. It was a very basic thing. None of us would be happy with this device today, but we were thrilled to get it in 2007. And so this was an amazing thing. And so we have to consider that at some point, experience trumps features. We have to think about the user's experience. And it turns out there is one more uh, inflection point here. That's when the core functionality gets subsumed by bigger things, right? Nobody buys a phone anymore to make phone calls. In fact, there's a whole generation of people we have uh, bred who refuse to make a phone call. But they all have phones. <laughs> Right? And so that is uh, absolutely remarkable. And that what happens is, is we get to another stage called the commodity stage. And you see weird things happen in the commodity stage. For example, a few years ago, American Airlines sued a company called GoGo InFlight. And what they're hoping to get out of the lawsuit was to actually break a 10-year contract that they had in its fifth year. GoGo InFlight created the Wi-Fi on the planes. They were the first people to create Wi-Fi on the planes. American Airlines signed up and signed this 10-year contract to have them service the Wi-Fi. But over time, uh, other companies created Wi-Fi for planes. Other carriers put the Wi-Fi on their planes. And the next thing American Airlines knows is that customers are telling them that they're actually booking on competitors' flights because the Wi-Fi sucks. Americans never been in the business of thinking about Wi-Fi before from a competitive standpoint. And suddenly, the quality of their Wi-Fi makes a difference. So they say to GoGo, -Go, upgrade. GoGo -Go says, you know, it's 10-year-old technology. And they're like, well, OK, we'll go with somebody else. You can't. You have a contract. They're like, OK, we're going to break the contract. We'll sue you. OK. That's what we did. And the judge laughed and threw the case out. Because who signs a 10-year contract for Wi-Fi? That's stupid. <laughs> but turns out that GoGo -Go figured out how to make their Wi-Fi better. American Airlines has kissed and made up with them. They're OK now. But here's the thing, right? That Wi-Fi is a component of a bigger thing. All of these things make a bigger experience. That's the commodity stage. Now, if we want to get to the experience and commodity stage, we have to get our teams to be infused UX design. If we want to own that marketplace, be the ones who are competing on experience, we have to have teams that get there. Except I still haven't really answered the question, how come Honeywell didn't invent the nest? Well, we can think of it this way. The H model was definitely a technology play. It came out, it was the first of its kind, it was the only thermostat that did what it did. People bought it. It was fantastic. Over the years, Honeywell decided to play with programmable devices to create more features. It never really took off. People never figured out how to use them. And then the Nest comes along. It's not programmable per se. You just plug it in, it just is smart, it does the right thing. So that's experience. But what really explains why Honeywell didn't get there is actually the other scale. Because when the H model came out, it was spot UX design. Henry Dreyfus was hired by Honeywell. He was the only one who understood design. He did his project. He left. And then Henry Dreyfus did what all great designers do. He died. <laughs> Seriously, if you become a great designer, you will die too. <laughs> you have that to look forward to. And Honeywell learned nothing from this experience. They learned nothing from 
uh, this at all. The Nest, on the other hand, when they were born, they started at infused UX design. They were there. They didn't have to go through all the stages. Now, there are those who tell me, maybe it's just that Honeywell uh, uh, didn't care. You know, they're a big company. They make lots of things. The furnace business was just a, or, and the boiler business and the, the thermostat part of that were just small pieces of their empire. Maybe this was just not important to them. So they, they don't care about that. I'm not sure I buy that because, you know, a few years later, Google comes along and they buy Nest for $3.2 billion. And I think Honeywell shareholders would have liked to have had that value added to their company. Right? That, that's, I think they did make a mistake. I think they should have cared if they didn't. But how did Nest start at Infused UX Design? Because after all, we thought, up until we realized this, that every company had to go through all the stages, that you had to go through them. But Nest didn't. Nest just started there. We thought, okay, maybe it's because they're a startup. And startups have some sort of superpower. One of the things that originally occurred to us is that maybe they're sort of like embryonic stem cells. Embryonic stem cells are these cells that form immediately upon conception. That's, their only job is to, is to rep replicate. And they make a lot of cells in a very short period of time. But what's interesting is they don't die off. Instead, they mutate into a different type of cell. At some point, some of the stem cells become uh, stomach cells, some become colon cells, some become liver cells. And the cells take on different functions. They do different things. So maybe startups work that way. Maybe when you're very small, you can do all the things, and then at some point, you hit some critical mass, and you start to find a particular stage, and that's where you end up. And we thought that actually might be true, because after all, we'd met a whole bunch of startups that behaved like colons. <laughs> but it turns out that uh, that's not it. It's a much simpler answer. It's a really trivial answer when you think about it. Nest was founded by a guy named Tony Fidel. And Tony Fidel was the lead designer behind the iPod, the iPhone, and the iPad. And Tony Fidel, as a startup founder, did what all startup founders do. He poached Apple for his old design team. So his initial employees were all very senior seasoned designers, just like him. And then as they grew the company, that team was in charge of hiring, and they would only hire people who understood design. No matter what function they rolled in, you worked in accounting, you had to understand design. And everybody in the company understood design on their first day of work. That's how they built an organization that was infused UX. Everybody understood how to make good design decisions. That's the only way you could get hired. Honeywell, on the other hand, was an, a standard company with people all over the maturity model. And as a result, many of them did not understand design. So the only way Honeywell could have put itself in the place where it could come up with a nest is either to fire everybody and replace them with people who are good designers, or to in fact, train everybody to become good at UX design. And more companies are in the position of Honeywell than are in the position of Nest. So this lesson is really important for us to learn. Now, there's one more inflection point in this scale that I did not mention. And that is a change. The change, before the change, where an organization exists, is they are in a place where the criteria for shipping a product or service is that the product itself works technically and that it be meets the business criteria. That's it. 
If it's not well designed, that's okay. We will fix it in the next release. The oft promised next release. All right. We will fix it in the next release. For a while, I thought that was Microsoft's tagline. <laughs> but the inflection point, which we call the UX tipping point, happens when suddenly a company decides that, yes, it has to work technically, it has to meet the business needs, but it also has to be well designed. We will not ship it until it is well designed. The Disney Magic Band was two years late. It was two years late because it only partially worked in 2012. It could open hotel room doors. That was it. It didn't work in the parks yet. And Disney was paranoid that if they put out something substandard, nobody would care, and they'd lose the magic of the thing. So they waited. A billion dollar project waited. The chairman of the board was calling the product managers every day. Is it done yet? Is it done yet? And they'd say no. They'd say, okay, do what you need to do. And they waited. They were so paranoid someone else would find this thing out and create a crappy Me Too product and ship it and then uh, uh, they would lose the magic of the event of showing this thing for the first time. So they kept it ultra secret for two years. This was an expensive, difficult process. But they were able to make sure that it had to ship because it was the right design. That's the tipping point. So how do we do that? Well, my friend Dan Mall likes to talk about the way we work, that we have this image that our design process is this thing like a Newton's pendulum where you just pull the ball back and you let it go and it does exactly the same thing every time. And we are so fixated on design processes. Right? We talk about design process all the time. What's your design process? What's your design process? We ask candidates in interviews, what's your design process? As if we will ever let them use it. <laughs> Hell, we will barely let them use our design process. Because we don't get to use our design process. Because nobody really uses their design process. Because design processes don't work like this thing where you pull the ball back and you let it go and it just automatically just works. That's not how a design process works. Design processes are messy. They are convoluted. They are more like a football game. You know, when the, the players run out onto the sports ball field and, you know, whether it's a, a football rink or a, a <laughs> hockey court or whatever it is, they, they don't come out with this giant Gantt chart <laughs> that has swim lanes for every player. And the coach doesn't say, Howard, in the last game you scored at 4 minutes and 42 seconds in the second quarter. Could you do that again? That was the perfect time to score. <laughs> That's our process. We always score at 4 minutes and 42 seconds in the game. <laughs> right? It's because the, the, the sports ball field is a messy place. We have to take into account the conditions of our team and the strengths of the other team and the weaknesses of the other team and our weaknesses and who's on the injured list and what the field conditions are and all the things. We have to be able to adapt to our situation. We have to have a lot of situational awareness all throughout the game and we have to adapt constantly to it. And the way that, that we do this is through the series of what we call plays. Plays are practiced, thoughtful, pre-considered outcomes that we have understood how we're going to achieve. And during the game, we adapt from one play to the next. And it turns out that 
There are lots of plays for UX strategy. We've counted at least 130. In fact, we're, we're adding more all the time. This is just a summary of them. And what's interesting is different plays help with different stages of growth. So we have to look at which plays are most effective for which stages of growth and pick the ones that are right for our situation. And no two teams are going to have the same set of plays at any given time because they have different situations. So here are just a, a couple of the, the plays that, that, that we find that are really effective. So for example, one is called immersive exposure. Immersive exposure is when we go out uh, and meet with our users. But we're not just meeting with our users. Our developers are meeting with them. Our product managers are meeting with them. We are bringing the, all the influencers with us because if they have true exposure to who our users are and what it's like to be our users, we see success. Now, teams often start by just usability testing, that thing we were training way back in 1997. That technique is still valid and useful and helpful today. It's a simple way to just say, if we ask people to do something, can they actually complete it with our design? Better is going out into the field, seeing the users in their own context, seeing them actually doing the things they want to do, not the things we ask them to do. Seeing the environments they work in, seeing what stickies are stuck to their monitor to help them get their job done. The more we can see these things, the better our designs get. In fact, we call every hour that someone sits with a user watching them use the product or somebody else's product or the old way they used to do this thing, we call that an exposure hour. And we have found that you see this incredible change in the quality of products just by increasing the number of exposure hours. In fact, that change point happens at a specific moment. It's when the team gets to two hours every six weeks. If you can get every member of your team, every influencer, to be exposed to two hours in a six-week period, and you repeat that, you will see a dramatic improvement in the design quality of the products and services you deliver because they are now seeing what it's like to be a user. And as they continue to see, they see what changes make a difference and what ones don't. And they become very aware of what users really need. And we can capture this information so simply. We go through all these rigmarole to make everything so complicated. Really, we just need simple ways to do things. We can use something like a customer journey map where we map out the milestones that the participant in our little study has done. And we then put that on a scale of extreme frustration to extreme delight. And then what I like to do is when I'm taking a team out to meet their customers, I will take the most senior stakeholder who I've managed to convince to come on this journey with us, and I will hand them a piece of paper, and I'll tell them to draw this chart. And then as the user does whatever we watch them do, they fill in the milestones, and they record what is delightful and what is frustrating. And we see that suddenly they're recording all of these different aspects. And they come out of that room going, oh my god, what do we do to our users? <laughs> right? We talk so much about empathy here. It's not that people don't have empathy and we somehow have to train them to have empathy. It's that we have to give them a way to use their empathy. And we don't give them a way to use that empathy unless we get them in front of our users. You can't communicate empathy through a videotape or a PowerPoint deck. It doesn't work. Those are empathy filters. The only way we can get them to have empathy is to make them sit there and watch a user swear at their computer. <laughs> Second thing is uh, shared experience vision. Shared experience vision helps with both literacy and fluency. It helps us understand 
where we're going with the design. It's asked the question five years from now, what will the experience of that user be when we've done a good job on the design? And you can think of this as a giant flag in the sand that we can see that's five years away. We're going to take us a long time to get there, but everyone in the organization can see this flag. And the only instructions we need is march towards the flag. We create this vision, we put it in the sand, and we say, everybody march towards it. And the beauty of having something like this is we now know where we're going. We know what we have to do, and we keep iterating on our design until we get there. It's going to take a long time, but we're OK with that. How do we figure out what that flag should be? Well, let's look at the journey map that we have, see the frustrating bits, and ask the question, what if we made them go away? What if it was delightful all the way across? What story would that be? That's our flag. Let's put that in the sand. Let's march towards that, an experience that's 100% delightful. Let's just do that. The last thing that we see that makes a difference in organization is having what we call a culture of continuous learning. And the culture of continuous learning is a literacy, fluency, and mastery play. And what it's about is understanding that we are always learning. Right now, we fetish failure. There is so much discussion about failure. We have to fail quickly. We have to fail often. We have to move fast and break things. Frankly, I think we moved a little too fast. We broke a few too many things. I'm going to let Kenneth talk about that later. But here's the thing. Uh, the, we don't need to, to talk about failure. I mean, nobody wants to be called into the CEO's office and asked, why did you fail? Well, sir, it's our mission to fail, and we wanted to make sure we were doing that. <laughs> and because we wanted you to see it, we made it extra big. <laughs> right. That's not good. OK. No. The question we would like to ask, answer is, what did we learn? What did you learn? We learned a ton of stuff. Trust me, we learned so many things. We're never doing it the same way again. Right? We always want to be doing things differently. And we can build this culture of learning. A culture has to be built in lots of little ways. You, you, it's not something you do one way. You have to do it in millions of little ways. For example, at our organization, at Center Center, we have students who are learning how to be UX designers. And every day, they go to a stand-up. And every day, they answer the standard stand-up questions. You know, what did you accomplish since the last stand-up? What are you planning to accomplish till the next stand-up? What are your big obstacles? But we added a question to this. And the question is, what was the most important thing you learned since the last stand-up? And how will it change what you do in the future? It's reflection. We take a moment to reflect. What did we learn? And everybody has to answer this question, no matter what position or role they're in. So the CEO of the organization, every day, is talking about something they learned in the last 24 hours. And when you have a CEO admitting that there was something they didn't know 48 hours ago that they now know, and they're going to behave differently in the future as a result of it, it gives permission to everybody to be learning all the time. And that's what a culture of continuous learning is. So these three plays, you just do these three out of the 130, you will see success in your organization. In fact, you may see so much success that one day you may have an experience that's not unlike a little girl walking up to uh, what's called the magic Mickey, and she holds out her wrist, and the Mickey makes this little whirring noise that's really cute. And suddenly, all of the Disney cast members, the employees of Disney, that are standing within about a two meter radius, turn around, look at her, and say, happy birthday, Angela. It's a little creepy, <laughs> but it's cool. That's a great user experience. And that's what I came to talk to you about. So, People learn through stages, from unconscious incompetence to unconscious competence. 
What we need is to get most of our team at least to conscious competence. So that's our mission. We also need to get our organizations from the dark ages to infused UX design if we're going to deliver great experiences. And finally, we need to make sure that we are thinking in terms of situational awareness, that we are creating our own playbooks that change dynamically because the situation changes. And we don't lock ourselves into a, a process that we think is going to work that never works. That's what I came to talk to you about. If you are interested in this, a weird thing is happening. We have a workshop that actually helps people create their playbooks. And we only do it in two places in the world. And for some strange reason, one of them is Manchester. <laughs> actually, it's not for a strange reason. It's because the folks at ThoughtWorks, amazing team, uh, I believe they're hiring, uh, uh, is uh, gracious to give us a chance to bring the workshop out of the US to other places. And Manchester is where they picked. It's a lovely place right up on the other side of the mall. It's beautiful. Uh, uh, and you can join us in September. We still have a few spots left if you want to bring your team for that. So that's one option. The other thing is there are articles about all this stuff. And in fact, in the next couple of weeks, we're launching a newsletter specifically about UX strategy uh, that'll be on the UIE website. Uh, and uh, if we are not connected on LinkedIn, uh, please, by all means, connect up with me. Uh, uh, it's where I find the, I can have a lot of good professional conversations. Say hi, I'll say hi back. We can talk about the challenges you face. Very excited to get to know you a little bit better. And then finally, you can follow me on the Twitters where I talk about design, design strategy, design experience. I argue with Andy Budd and <laughs> just because you should. And uh, I talk about the amazing customer service habits of the design industry. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for encouraging my development.